um, because that's something that really hurt me, but maybe you don't want to go there yet. We can get to that. Uh, but okay. just, um, because that moment that you're describing in many ways was included in your book, preceded by some moments in Gaza. Mm. And I just wondered, uh, there's a, a moment, if you don't mind kind of elaborating a little bit about when you were, I think it was Ramadan again, to an iftar again, feeling very frustrated that people were trying to feed you and they actually had very little. Yeah. Um, would you say that that was, if you like, a mirror moment to that moment of acceptance in your life? That, you know, maybe there's a... So this was two, this was actually before that, 2008. I, I lived in Gaza for a month by the grace of Allah. I'm so grateful for that experience. I was under siege. I couldn't leave. Uh, I actually got a job and was going to get a, an apartment. Remember, I had a five-year-old and an eight-year-old in France. And the Egyptians said, you might never see your kids again. And it was the only time in my life that I used the do you know who I am card. And that was because people were telling me, Tony Blair's a Middle East envoy. Try and let him get you out of Gaza. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. And part of it was pride, and part of it was he probably wants me here and he's laughing <laughs> with his friends in Jerusalem. They're going, ha ah, ah, ha ah. ha. And of course, so I did, I called the uh, envoy's office and I said, okay, don't gloat too much. Can you get me out of Gaza, please? I need to go home. Laura, are you stuck? We didn't know. That's a shame. The Israelis will help. I'm like, are you joking me? Put the phone down and I could almost hit him going, <laughs> you know. Anyway, that's my imagination about that. But it was Ramadan. I was there for the whole month. And I went to a slum or a really broken, not a slum because they're not dirty, but a really broken down part of Rafa. And I was bringing some food to an utterly impoverished one room home. And the cameraman said to me, whatever you do, don't eat whatever the mum tries to give you. I said, why? He said, because the children won't eat if you do, and we can get something later. So I said, okay. So I go into this one room with no furniture in it, and the mother has laid out the iftar for her 10 people in her family, and it was one plastic plate of hooves bread, one plastic plate of salad, one plastic plate of hummus, um, and that was it. And then she got me a plastic plate and she put most of it on it. And I said, but I've brought you food. And she said, no, but you're, you're the guest. And I could see children's faces peeping through a window and they were her children who'd been fasting and I hadn't even been fasting. And she gave me as much as, as she could on the plate and then I got really angry and I said why does your faith make you do this what is the point in this I don't understand it why are you fasting and she said I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor a woman who had nothing in dunya not what a stick of furniture not a day of peace not a light in her house not uh, any of the hopes that we have, but she was content to give away for her Lord. Wow, that really touched me. I thought, if this is Islam, wow, I want to be Muslim. This is something out of this world. So, again, another one of the juxtapositions that you put in your book, which I think really uh, is very powerful, is the, I think this is not just about non-Muslims and Muslims, mm -hmm. I think we were talking before about it being it's the westernized setting or the modern setting yeah. or whatever, but yeah. the kind of materialism that a lot of us live in yeah. and actually losing sight of actually things like that and it's about uh, being thankful and all about how, you know, how that all ties in. Do you think that, you know, we are up against a, a huge brick wall here, the kind of materialism is swallowing all of us, is there a way that we can maybe 